challenges and also the improvements as well, especially in our basic education level in, in this country. There's always been that talk that we, we, we cannot continue to overly focus on the secondary education when the basic education has its own challenges. So this morning, we will talk about that and proper solutions for the way forward and improving on the situation as we have it in Ghana. To set the ball rolling with the opening remarks, shall we please make welcome Eunice Agbenyaji, who's the head of programs, Star Ghana Foundation. Let's put our hands together for her. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning to everyone that has made the time to join this conversation, which we consider a very uh, important one, uh, because if you can speak English or any other language, if you can write, if you can access job, education has made a contribution to that. We are all products of education, and therefore, uh, it's important that we are part of the conversations that seek to ensure that our educational system is um, effective. We have had partnership with the uh, Media General, I think since 2010, the Star Ghana, Star Ghana program was uh, established. And we are happy that since then, um, you have remained consistent in your commitment to ensuring that the rights of citizens to quality education is safeguarded or uh, uh, secured. And I remember that in 2018, we also had a conversation right in this room around the free senior high education. So what we are doing is just, you know, building on the previous work that you, you have done. And we are happy as Targada Foundation to be a partner. So I said a partner because for us, we are not a passive financiers. We work with our partners in creating interventions. We work with our partners in implementing them, drawing lessons, and using those for our future programming. So we are not a financial sponsor. We are a partner, and we are happy that we have remained a partner to TV3, uh, Media General, all these uh, years. I think the conversation we are having is so critical and actually right in time. Uh, because, you know, we are going into the elections very soon in December. And we have come to realize that, or currently we know that the political parties are drafting their manifestos, right? So, and we have come to know the importance of manifestos in our development. Indeed, in the past, we would see transition from political party manifestos to national development plans, right? So the promises are made in the manifestos and the party that wins when they come into government, they work with the uh, civil service, the bureaucrats to translate those promises into national plans and programs. But we are also seeing a shift in rights from, you know, uh, manifesto promises to implementation. And Free Senior High School is a typical example of a manifesto promise that has moved from manifesto promise into implementation. What that means is that we must be interested in what the political parties put together in their manifestos because eventually they will find their ways into uh, implementation. And so my hope is that the conversations we are going to have here with the students, which is important because you are the beneficiaries of the education system at a level. Uh, some of us are parents. We have our children uh, in school. Those 
those that are experts also, you know, have their children. And they have, so we all have lived experiences with the uh, educational system. So my hope is that through the conversations, we will identify key issues and find ways of presenting this to the political uh, parties. I know there are members on the panel that are already doing that, but I think that if Media General also takes up the challenge and say that based on this conversation, these are the recommendations we are putting forward to the political parties, I think that we would be leveraging impact from all uh, ends. As Targana Foundation, in preparation towards, you know, influencing um, the political party manifestos, we have undertaken town halls. So we have moved into the regions to have conversations with citizens, so from the informal sector, from the school, from the formal sector, all around the diversity of uh, citizens. And the town halls sought to understand the priorities of citizens on three key areas in terms of education, health, and uh, social uh, uh, protection. And the idea is that from the town halls, we will pull out issues that we would use as we access different spaces to interact with the political parties. And we have started uh, those kind of interactions. And so I want to put forward some of the issues that have come from the town halls because I think that they will be important for the uh, panels to reflect on. And they will also be important for the issues we agree as a, a, a a team here that should be uh, taken uh, forward. So from the town halls in, in, on education, I just want to put forward three of the uh, uh, key issues. Ghanaians are saying that the political parties should address the disparities we see in access to quality basic education. Uh, and between rural and urban, communities, right? Um, and we, we, we know that we have made progress as of 2020, 2022, we had achieved a net enrollment of 93%, which is remarkable. However, there are many issues, you know, uh, lingering on uh, equitable access. So for example, the Ghana Statistical Service says in the last uh, census that there are over one million children who have never been to school in a middle income country like ours. In addition, there are about 400,000 school children between age four and 18 that have dropped out of school, you know, and the rural schools or deprived uh, communities are disproportionately affected. So what that means is that they have a huge number of these uh, statistics that I have uh, talked about. In terms of infrastructure, so infrastructure, we look at school, uh, school blocks, uh, decks, etc. And our partner, Africa Education Watch, which does a lot of research in the area, estimates that about 40% of peoples do not have access to DEX. So that is a national uh, percentage. If you compare that to rural uh, communities, they have 80% uh, no access to infrastructure or, 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 or deaths. So you are seeing already the rural and urban disparities in terms of infrastructure, in terms of even access uh, uh, to school. And textbooks, um, in 2019, the, uh, we introduced the new curriculum, and as at now, only 65% of textbooks in the four core subjects are available in schools. And Africa Education Watch again um, reveals or has found out from its uh, research that there are even some schools in deprived communities that do not have one single uh, textbooks. 
textbook, all right? So what does all of this mean for uh, emphasis of political parties in their manifestos on education, access, and quality? We are suggesting all from the town halls that we should fund education adequately, and I don't want to go into the statistics, the experts will do so. But we must do that with equity lens. So equity lens means that if you have to distribute your resources, you'll be doing that based on needs. And so if rural areas have less of these resources, you want to ensure that they, 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 they have more uh, in the allocation and indeed the execution. The second issue is a free senior high uh, school. There is consensus that this policy should be re-looked really at. And the, the recommendation is that we target the free senior high school appropriately. Uh, those of us who do social policy studies, we know that targeting in social policy is laborious, and sometimes the resources you need to be able to even target may be more than the resource you need to be able to provide the uh, or deliver the social uh, policy. But we have invested already in the single household registry, which is still on pilot in five uh, regions. And so uh, if we want to target free senior high school, one is to look at the information that exists in terms of of uh, poverty, low-income uh, households. But the other is also to expand and let the free, uh, National Single Household Registry cover the nation as a whole so we can do the targeting properly. I have been notified that I have two minutes, so I'll talk quickly about the inclusive education. Um, and I'm Talking about that because I know Media General has done a lot of work with us in terms of following the inclusive education policy development, monitoring the implementation, and also convening a conversation. If we want inclusive education policy to work, we must fund it, and we should discuss innovative ways of funding uh, the inclusive education. And I know many, many other issues would come up from the interaction. So thank you very much, and we do look forward to a very engaging and fruitful conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much, Star Ghana Foundation. Thank you for all the support and also being with us since 2010. It's been 14 years of a very productive partnership with you. For the persons who are going to come up next, we would have five minutes. Here's how the structure of the program will be. We'll have five minutes opening remarks from all of them, and then we'll have a plenary session, and we'll take questions from you as well. And it's important that Madam make the point that we should be very interested in the political parties' manifestos, because it is you and I, our money, that will be used to fund the manifesto promises. They are not going to take their money from their bank accounts. So be interested. That's why we're doing this this morning. So to start off the remarks, the representative of the Minister of Education, he is the spokesperson for the Education Ministry, Mr. Kwasi Kwateng, please, let's put our hands together for him. Thank you, Alfred. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. I want to extend the remarks of the Honorable Minister for Education, the Honorable Dr. Yaosei Duchum, to all of you, uh, particularly the organizers of this event. Of course, events like this serves as a very good platform uh, for discussing national issues, uh, particularly those borders on education. And for us in the Ministry of Education, it becomes a very positive feedback or good feedback for all of us 
to be able to improve upon what we are already doing. Uh, at every point, we are always reminded that the people of Ghana gave us the responsibility and the mandate. Uh, largely, if you want to take it maybe from the political angle, uh, the mandate stems from the fact that we came out with some manifesto promises of which the people of Ghana bought into it and gave this government the mandate. And so at every point, it is only fair, uh, it is only uh, uh, expected that based on the mandate that you give to the us, we account to the good people of Ghana on how far we have fared as a people. I mean, certainly when it comes to education, we may be looking at some marginal gains. At the same time, we may also have the I mean, the, the heart to also admit some level of challenges that all of us holistically can resolve them. But I've always maintained that when it comes to discussions like this and platform like this, it ought to be done very dispassionately, particularly without the, I mean, partisan lenses, so that we should be able to uh, make a headway going for it. At every point from the Ministry of Education, we are always reminded that uh, when we talk about education, certainly it borders on three key variables. One has to do with access, the second has to do with uh, quality, and of course the last has to do with relevance. And of course access, you are looking at access from the basic level. I mean, I mean the question about basic level, the definition about basic level, where it ends is quite in context. Because if you move to other jurisdictions, you realize that the secondary education is also included in basic education. But I mean this morning when I was going through my referral notes, I noticed that the pre-tertiary act uh, particularly defines basic education only up to uh, junior high school level. I mean, and, and I mean, if you want to just suppose that with uh, other jurisdictions all over the world, you will realize that there is uh, a quite weak link, uh, especially at the junior high school level. Because if you look at the normal practice that we are having as a country, instead of giving true meaning or true reflection to high school education, We've decoupled the junior high school education and now made it look like the primary education. You go into their campuses, a lot of times the same teachers teaches them the same uniforms, they eat the same uh, uh, food, almost does the same thing together. So, the, the, I mean, in terms of the general overview, one can argue or admit that there is a, a very high uh, weak link at that level of our education landscape. And of course, much has been done uh, with regards to access. Uh, even when you look at the free compulsory universal basic education as a program which has quite fared well, but of course, uh, in terms of quality too, we may also have to admit that there are some level of challenges. I mean, we make even admonition on the school feeding program at the basic level. Of course, at the second, secondary school level too, there are a lot of interventions and government efforts, but I mean, we also admit that there have to be some significant improvement also there. But, I mean, if you look at the figures, at a country where some few years ago, prior to 2017, we look into the faces of almost 100,000 students and deny them access to education, uh, particularly at the senior high school level, uh, just on the basis that we do not have infrastructure. It was a burden on us to creatively and innovatively find a way to respond to that challenge. And how did we go about it? With the introduction of the free SHS program, of course, it will, I mean, it gave cause to a, a high rise, but we were able to innovatively go about it, and through the introduction of the double track policy, we were able to increase access at the same time, ensuring quality. As well as that now, if you look at the figures, currently we have about 1.4 million students in our senior high schools, and the cumulative effect is about 5.7 million beneficiaries that has also benefited from the senior high school uh, policy. I mean, it is also important to also stress that all over the world, when access increases, the general template has always been that quality reduces. But in the case of Ghana, uh, we were able to defy the us. And I've always maintained that even though we are not where we have to be, certainly we are also not where we used to be. So we have to also look into our faces and pat ourselves and say that, well, I mean, there has been some marginal significance. Because if you look at the data from the WASI performance, clearly, there has been consistent and significant improvement trends in it, with at least f more than 50% of our students that graduate getting uh, at least between A1 to C6 in all the core subjects. 
Then you come to quality. In terms of quality, there are a lot have been done for teachers. The one uh, in terms of technological advancement for teachers, one teacher, one laptop, one student, one laptop. These are all interventions. But ultimately, like I indicated, at every point, access uh, coupled with quality have to have an impact on our socioeconomic transformation. And how do we go about that? That is where you deepen the quality component and make sure that the education that you are giving to your people or your students will indeed have an impact on the socioeconomic transformation that you want as a people. And so it is a more reason why, uh, as for us as a government, even though we promise free SHS, we also find it quite imperative to also uh, introduce them so that gradually we're able to reposition Ghana's education from the era of uh, just reading and writing, just memorization, so that we'll be able to produce a mass number of critical students that are assertive, that are able to challenge status quo, that are problem solvers, and that is currently our focus. Training students to be able to fix within the fourth industrial evolution, within the 21st in, uh, century uh, demands. Of course, uh, there are a lot that uh, still ought to be done, but like I indicated, as a country, uh, we've done quite significant well. But I mean, platforms like this will certainly give us the feedback to also be able to prove upon what we have been doing. Thank you. Thank you, Kwesi. And, and that's why we're here, to give you feedback. Because he spent quite a lot of his time talking about free senior high school. Oh, we're talk, going to talk about basic education. You defined it quite well, that it it's obviously doesn't include senior secondary or senior high school education. Um, but as for the gains, the likes of Dr. Peter Patianti and you know, Kofi have done quite some work in also looking at both the gains and some areas of improvement as well. Because when you're talking about one teacher, one laptop, I was looking at you some way. Because some of the teachers are still asking for their laptops, because about 100,000 of them don't have the laptops. Some of them too have issues with the laptop. It's a story that we are working on as we speak. And talk about financing as well. Two weeks ago, we had a report from Africa Education Watch. Senior high school students are still paying, paying money. Hmm? It's not true. You won't say it. Anyway, we see he's here, so he'll take the feedback. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. And we'll take the remarks of um, Kofi Asari, who is the Executive Director of the Africa Education Watch. Uh, he's here with us, as well as uh, Dr. Peter Pate Anti, who is the Executive Director of the Institute for Education Studies, and then also with the Department of Business Sciences and Social Education at the University of Cape Coast. Also with us is Ani Safar, who is the founder of the Gate Institute, also a quality education advocate as well. Please, let's put our hands together for all of them as they're here. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. Stay with us. This is the National Policy Dialogue on Basic Education coming to you live from the Executive Theatre here at TV3. We're also live on radio all across the world on 3news.com, on TV3 Ghana, on Facebook as well. So thousands of you who are out there watching us, you can share your thoughts and the questions. We'll definitely put it up to the persons who are here to answer. We'll be back shortly. Stay with us. We are still on the National Policy Dialogue on Basic Education. So we please make welcome our next speaker, who's going to give us five minutes remarks. So we go straight into the plenary session. And Kofi Asari, Executive Director of the Africa Education Watch, let's put our hands together for him. Thank you, Alfred, and uh, Media General Star Ghana for the opportunity. And um, good morning to all our audience. We appreciate that in the 1992 Constitution, um, Article 38, government committed to providing free composite universal basic education for all its citizens. By extension, once you're school going age, by age four you should be in kindergarten one, where formal basic schooling starts. In fulfillment of that, government committed to the Millennium Development Goals much earlier, and currently the Sustainable Development Goals. The target is to ensure that all children of school-going age enroll and complete 
the full cycle of basic education with the relevant learning outcomes. That is how we measure our performance, and that is how we, 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 we aim to improve policy. Um, um, this is the end to which we aim to improve upon policy. According to the government's statistician, about 1.4 million children are out of school. 400,000 of that number were once in school and dropped out. One million haven't been in school before. 500,000 are still of basic school-going age. Half of them are girls. The target is to ensure that everyone is in school by 2030. About 10% of the basic education age cohort are not in school. This situation is a challenge, but it is more challenging looking at the fact that Ghana has made significant gains in improving access to basic education. About 92% net enrollment. That is great, one of the highest in the sub-region. Okay. But if you look on the flip side, there's a huge challenge with survival rates. Survival rate is the rate at which people enroll at the beginning of basic education and complete. And what makes it troubling over the past three decades is that there is a rural urban dimension in pursuit of this objective of basic enrollment and completion. Today in Ghana, out of 10 people who enroll in kindergarten, one, only six and a half will complete junior high school three. In, that's a national average, 35% drop out by the time they get to junior high school three after starting the journey in KG1. But in the deprived districts, and I'm talking about in the six regions of the, the northern region and OT, out of that same 10 that enroll in KG1, only three will get to junior high school three. So you see, along the line, our education system has become a sieve, where as we progress, more drop out than complete, especially in the deprived part of the country. There are about 75 deprived districts in Ghana. The conditions for equitable access and quality is as the stark opposite of what pertains in the urban areas. But you see, education in itself is supposed to be an instrument for bridging the gap. And bridging the gap uh, between unequal people. It should be an instrument for transforming people out of poverty. But unfortunately, our basic education system is gradually becoming an instrument for widening the inequity that exists in our society. And that is why we must be concerned that the rural urban divide in basic education keeps deepening. If you look at primary junior high school transition, that is the greatest point of the dropout. At the national level, about 92% of students are able to cross from primary school to junior high school. And Kwesi admitted that our basic education system has primary decoupled from junior high school. Crossing that bridge is, is, is key. 92% are crossing from primary six to junior high school one. But in the deprived regions, you find that 82%, which means that 18% are dropping out between, between P6 alone and junior high school one. Now, the reason for these dropouts and the poor school survival, especially in the deprived part of the country, is due to three. I mean, the reasons are due to three. One, limited infrastructure. And I'll, let me put it this way. Lack of adequate primary schools. The distance to school is a major factor in causing dropouts. Averagely, no student should be working more than three kilometers to school if you are in primary school. According to GES's protocols, no, they are not written, but that, that's the convention. Three kilometers at primary maximum should be the working distance. People are doing more than five and ten kilometers to primary. It causes dropout. So they will enroll, and you will see 98% enrollment, but they won't complete because of the distance to complete to school. So first is distance. Second is the lack of junior high schools in 4,000 out of 15,000 primary schools. We don't have junior high schools. Almost 25%. We don't have junior high school. So if you complete primary school in this community, you have to do a journey 10 kilometers to the next community, especially in these six regions I mentioned, the five in the north and Uti. That is a major cause of the dropout between P6 and junior high school one. And there are schools in Kintampo North where one requires their own desk to be able to gain admission to a junior high school, even where available. 
And I've moved to the third issue, which is lack of adequate infrastructure. When infrastructure for children learning is scarcely available in deprived schools, it doesn't encourage retention, even though you achieve higher levels of enrollment. And so that's the third factor accountable for the deepening relevant divide in our basic education journey. The last one is teacher availability. We still have an oversupply of teachers in many urban and peri-urban classrooms, and the opposite in many rural classrooms. There was a recent case which we all saw in Afram Plains, in one of the communities where there was one teacher, um, the school is called, I think here I was, I forgot the name of the school, where one teacher handles from primary one to primary six, from KG one to primary six, one female teacher, who is called uh, Janet. Um, that is not news, okay, it's not news. But the news for me will be the day we begin to see different stories because teachers were posted there but they didn't go. The reality is that if we continue to run a, the current teacher deployment system the way it is, we will continue to deepen the relevant divide in basic education access because teachers will be scarcely available in deprived communities to give hope for children there to assess an education, even when there is infrastructure. And so, my submission is that today in Ghana, the greatest problem in our basic education system is that three and a half out of 10 children who start the journey at KG1 do not complete junior high school three at the national level. But in deprived communities, in, in deprived rural Ghana, it is seven out of 10 dropping out. They don't make it. And so only, the, only three out of 10 will even have the chance of tasting free secondary education from the six um, regions that I'm talking about. And insofar as the government of Ghana recognizes that education is the most important tool to re-engineer society, to bridge the inequality gap and make society more equal, it behoves on us to begin to fashion policies that are inequitable, that aim to bridge the gap in equitable access bet between endowed, so-called endowed districts or endowed regions in Ghana and the deprived regions in Ghana so that we will attain parity when it comes to access to quality basic education by 2030. Thank you very much. Coffee. Please, let's put our hands together for Kofi Asari. Thank you so much. Kofi, this detail is important indeed. And um, uh, talking about carrying decks, it's still like, it's, this, it's going on. <laughs> I mean, those days, you'll be carrying decks, and now, because of development and advancement, you want to think that some of these things don't happen, but it's, it's going on as we speak. And so the issue about access is one of the areas that we're going to be talking about um, this morning. Next, to build up on that foundation that has been laid, this gentleman is Dr. Peter Patianti. Um, please, let's welcome him. Let's put our hands together for him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me say that I'm going to talk about what the government has been doing since 2017 to provide um, basic education to the people of Ghana. So when the government took over the reins of power, they decided to touch various aspects of our educational system. And I think that the focus was to improve learning outcomes. So in doing that, they touched the curriculum, they touched teacher um, training issues, they touch management and administration. And then they also touch, um, they, they, they try to also look at how they will be able to assist in the provision of uh, infrastructure. So you see that for the first time, capitation grant was increased from four Ghana cities to 10 Ghana cities, around 2018 thereabouts. So that, that, that is an effort that they, they, they put in place. And then in terms of the um, uh, teacher quality, then we were able to move from the practice where teachers were having, uh, from where teachers were not even having um, any kind of certificate to now teachers should have a minimum qualification of a degree to be able to teach at the pre tertiary level. Again, the standard-based curriculum was also introduced to ensure some kind of parity in terms of the delivery that is supposed to take place at the basic level. Then they also introduced NASIA. So the inspectorate body was converted to a, a, a bigger uh, authority that 
was supposed to be equipped and then monitor teaching and learning in our schools. So if, if you step back and look at all these interventions, the ideal thing to should have, that should have happened would be that by the time that we get into 2024, looking at the strategic plan that we had, we should be getting closer to some of the targets that we set for ourselves at the basic level. But that, that, is, that is not the case. And Kofi has delved into some of the statistics. I wouldn't go in there. But one of the biggest problems that we have seen is the problem of coordination and lack of monitoring at the basic level and all the reforms that we, we have implemented. So we implemented the standard-based curriculum. And this is a, a known story. For over four, five, six years, there was no textbook in these uh, basic schools. And when we started introducing the textbooks, we came to the point that the disparity became wider because the colleagues or our friends in the private schools had the textbooks right from the go. And then those in the public schools did not have access to any textbooks. I don't know that they are going to write the same uh, exams. And we talk about textbooks, the, the core was that we are not so much interested in the textbooks because we have introduced a standard base, which was quite erroneous. So that is a big problem with the curriculum that we introduce. And because of that, as at now, and every teacher, uh, those who are on the field will tell you that the teachers have gone back to their old ways of implementing the curriculum, which is very bad because the things that were envisaged to have gone on with the implementation of the standard-based curriculum in terms of classroom instruction, teacher-learner interaction, and all those in between, because of lack of monitoring and supervision, and then provision of adequate resources, we were not able to achieve that. So that progress that we made, we, we, we came back to zero. Then we also have the NASIA that we, we put in place, the, 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 the school inspectors, what we call the CISOs, who were supposed to also go to the schools and do monitoring and supervision. NASIA is started with resources. So you talk to a, a school inspector, he tells you that the number of schools under him or her is enormous, that he's not able to visit them um, during the, the term that he's supposed to visit. So we wanted to, we wanted to improve on monitoring and supervision in terms of the... The, the, the activities in our schools, we were not able to do that because we were not conscious enough to fund or finance or resource these people to carry on with their mandates that we've given them. What we have been able to do successfully is the graduation of teachers from the diploma and the certificate level to degree. So there have been various programs, three semester programs, five semester programs that have been implemented by various tertiary institutions that are helping these teachers to upgrade themselves and respond to the needs of the time. And that, that, that is a very good thing that we, we have done. Unfortunately, we are not able to reap the benefits of that quality because of the disparity in terms of teacher deployment, as Kofi talked about. So because in most of our rural settings, the number of teachers, what you call the teacher to, uh, to people ratio, is way above the standard or the national average of 1 is to 40. We are not able to um, get the needed attention. I mean, the students are not able to get the needed attention that they need from the teachers. And that is also problematic. And when you, when you put all this together, you would see that we have tried to improve our basic education, but that improvement have not yielded or led or would not lead to the improved um, teaching, learning, and then le outcomes because all these measures that we put in place, we have not made conscious efforts to track the progress of them and ensure that we'll be able to reap the, the best out of it. The last thing I want to talk about is our attempt to provide infrastructure at the basic level. Now, the, 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 and, and there's, a, there's a plan, and I think uh, the ministry have started, and I, I've, I've been thinking and going around about this, and I still think that it doesn't make financial sense and efficiency in terms of what we want to do going forward in providing uh, resources at the basic level. The ministry is now constructing schools and then at the end of the day, they will decommission certain basic schools and then they'll put them under one roof. And I think that is what um, my, my brother Quartin was referring to, the, the disconnect between the junior high school and the senior high school and then the attempt to now bring all these students under one roof 
and then one administration, one headmaster, and all those things. I think that is highly inefficient, and that should cease as early as possible. Because, you see, in 2021, the Ghana Statistical Service published a, a residential proximity to essential services report, and they indicated that in Ghana, 26% of rural communities do not have access to any form of education. When we talk of any form of education, we are talking about early childhood, kindergarten, um, pri primary, junior high school, and then senior high school. Of course, senior high school is not even they don't have that at all. So if we have resources to build new schools so that we will decommission the ones that are already there, then what we needed to do or what we need to do is to provide these communities with the schools that they do not have. And these reports are available. I'm thinking that this is what the ministry should be uh, looking into. Again, the ministry sits on a good kind of data in terms of what happens in every single basic school in this country. By a click, they know the number of schools that do not have the number of DEXs that Kofi is talking about. By a click, they know the number of schools that needs major repairs and minor repairs. They have all that data available. What they have refused to do and what we are reaping now is that they do not have any kind of policy direction in terms of provision of these kinds of educational resources to the requisite communities that need them. And that is why Madam Eunice was talking about equity. So in most instances, we see the provision of educational resources to communities that already have them. And then those who do not have them, we have left them behind. And we have been using this model for all these years and we widening the gap of inequality between the rural and the urban center. We think that going forward, we need to think through the provision of educational resources by adopting the equity principle and ensuring that when we say we are providing DEXs based on the data and the, the, the analysis that we have done, we go to the communities that need these things and start provisioning. I mean, start providing those things from that particular uh, place. By the time we realized, we would have brought most of these bases to, to a level that can be compared to those in the urban centers. Thank you. Thank you. Please, let's put our hands together for Peter Party Anti. Thank you very much. And the first time I spoke to this man or I interviewed this man, this was sometime in 2008. On, on Choice FM, those days. These days we talk about STEM, STEM, STEM. This is a man who has been passionate about quality and transformative education over the period. And he has been consistent about reforming the basics of our education sector if we want to really build a superstructure up there. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker for the brief remarks before we get into our plenary session, Anisa Far, quality education advocate, founder of Gate Institute. Please, let's put our hands together for him. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning. It's good to see all of you. Whenever I see young people, I feel enticed to live as long as I can. I turned 70, I'll be 77 years uh, this month. But I refuse to die because of young people like you. So give yourselves a hand. I need your prayers to live a long time to see what we can do to help this country. Now, the, uh, I, I think Kofi spoke uh, about the dropout rates. And frankly, I'm glad he's here because he has all the statistics. That is not a job that I do. I just train teachers. Uh, so that we can have quality educational outcomes. But I want to add a word to what you're saying here. The, uh, there was a program that I used to do uh, with the uh, Ghana National Association of Private Schools. And our business was to go from place to place, Kumase, Accra, Wa, to get young people into the culture of reading. Because reading has become something that's almost, I don't see people reading. And but then we have to read because if we want to access the internet, whatever, we have to be able to read. But guess what? We went all the way to Wa. And uh, we, before we started, I had a conversation with one of the headmasters there. And he said, what are you here to do? He said, oh, we are here to come to the school to see how we can get young people to engage in quality reading. And he said, well, you'll be lucky if you can have them. Because a lot of them, have gone all the way to Wa, to the, uh, to the border, to do betting. 
Are you with me? Do you see these betting signs uh, on the billboards here? They are all over the country, and it's a major distraction for our young people. So this is something that I want us to be aware of right from the get. Now, what is it that we have to do? We're going to look at political parties, and uh, there are all kinds of manifestos, but there are practical things that need to be done, and that is one of them. And I hope they will add it to their manifestos. Do I hear amen on that one? Amen. Very good. Now, the, uh, my concern is what I call the cognitive infrastructure. How do we help teachers to give up them, uh, the best of themselves? Because students are quite interesting people. They can come to a classroom and find out a teacher who is not prepared and organized. It's very easy. It's very easy to do. Uh, now they are looking for this. Now they are looking for that and so on. And I will share one example with you. You know, I went to school in Cape Coast in Fanspim in the 1960s. And uh, those were different times. Those were the days where you study music on a piece of paper. And they will call you to the uh, piano to strike what you call the middle C. And you strike it and you go back and they clap for you. That was the extent of the music that you studied. There was nothing like what we call authentic assessment. Authentic assessment means what is the, uh, how do we prove that this person can play music? It was zero. The other one was French. We studied French. I studied French for about four years. Subject, verb, ag agreement. Plural, singular, four years. Me, to me, I can't French it that. And I'm sure some of you guys are victims of this. Are you with me? Good. Now, the other thing is this. Again, we need to look at uh, where we've come from the colonial times because there are repercussions of it still in the system. In our time, if you study art for the old levels, you get 50%. If you study uh, woodwork, you get 50%. But if you study Latin, 100%. And if you study Greek, 100%. So what was the motivation for people to get things done? Sometimes I look at my own secondary education and I realize how victimized I was. Victimized in the sense that you've done all the things that you're supposed to do, but there isn't much you can do. And that brings me back to Ghana and especially to politicians. The way they were, we were educated and a lot of them educated the same way. In our time, the issue was this. What are the advantages and disadvantages of something? And then you memorize it and you produce that for examination. Uh, when you look at what you call the profile dimensions, that, that's the lowest aspect of our learning, knowledge. You produce knowledge because knowledge was scarce in those days. Now, and we have to be blunt about this, we put people in positions where they can't perform. What they will do, they will tell you all the problems, but put them in a position to solve problems, and it becomes very difficult for them. But, but you can't blame them too much. We're not raised to be doers. Are you with me? We're raised to talk. All you have to do is go on television and see all the talking that is taking place. Go on the radio and see and hear and see all the talking that is happening. Give a person a responsibility and the story changes. So now let's look at the 21st century and what it is that we need for education going forward. The question that we have to ask every person who's studying is this. For all the education that you're getting, what is a product that you can produce that will make another person's life easier? That's a key compo component, and it's called authentic assessment. Not a summative assessment. A summative assessment is where you pass or you fail. That's not what we're talking about. What is it that you can produce at the end of this career? Of, uh, first of all, let's look at the number of years that we spend in, in school. How many years do we spend in lower... Uh, in, in lower primary? How many? Lower primary? Three. What about upper primary? How many years is that? And JHS, how many years? So total of what? Nine years now. And senior high school, how many years? Total of what? I'm checking your mathematics though. Twelve years plus four years of university education. How many years is that? Sixteen years. It's when you come out that they tell you to be a problem solver. So what happened all between that time? And again, I'm not speaking to you about statistics because that's not my job. My job is how we train teachers to be successful. Now, I will share a last uh, story with you. I was called by an organization at Legon. These are young people who have done their bachelor's degrees. And they came out and they realized that there was nothing for them to do. 
So the question I ask them is this. What is it that you can do? And you know something? They won't even look at you in the eye. All I'm trying to see, get you to see is how we are educating our young people and for us to decide whether this is the way we want to go. It doesn't matter the political party. Many times I come to a place like this and say, are you part A or part B? And I say, look, my concern is with Ghana. Because when Ghana is good, it's good for everybody. It's not just for one group of people. Now, these people have now come to do a master's degree. The issue being that they had been insufficiently prepared for a lifetime of having a job, being purposeful, and that sort of thing. So now they've come to do a master's degree. Are you with me? Now, if the master's degree, the instruction is going to follow the same modality as what has brought them to the same place, then what is the point of it? So the point I'm raising is this. We need to really take the quality instruction very importantly. And again, I like to use my examples too. I taught in the US for many years. Huh? And fortunately, in 1984, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs produced the first desktop computer. Do you guys remember? You guys are so young. And I bought my first copy. Uh, excuse me. I bought my first desktop computer and a printer. It changed my life. So when we talk about the, uh, the laptops that are being uh, distributed to young people, we have to take it seriously. Because what happens then is this. With or without books, I could prepare my own teacher and learning materials. Are you with me? Yeah. Up to today, from 1984, all the materials that I prepared to teach, I still have them. Wow. Because they're on computers. So what I'm saying is this. We cannot have illiteracy uh, passing off as teaching standards. Are you with me? We have to raise our teachers to a point where there's the enthusiasm, number one, to go into place to teach. Can you imagine how difficult it will be for you to stand in front of young people when you are not prepared and when you are not prepared sufficiently? So all I'm saying is this. As we go into the 21st century, it's so much easier now. And I, let me be honest with you. Even at my age, I'm studying more now than I've ever done in my life because it's easier, you know? Those days where we had to memorize information and so on, I was bad at it. I hated it. But now, there's no need for that. So the issue is this. For all the information that you are getting, what can you use it for? So even when we begin to look at assessment, assessment is not for someone to continue producing information for you. Because the Google can do it better than you. So how can you source information, and I'm talking to you young people, to make sure that you develop a certain purpose you go on the internet, you get the right information to make you functional. So, my last point is this. The education outcomes are very, very important. I can identify with all the difficulties that have been uh, exposed here. But looking forward, and I'm talking to young people, take your life into your own hands. Because it's much easier now to be successful than it's ever been. On that note, thank you very much. Thank you, Zani Safa. Fantastic. Take your life into your own hands. It's more successful um, for us as a country and as a people um, than, than previous years or years gone by. I think that that's one of the most instructive statements that we can take away from here because of the many issues that we have identified as challenges and bottlenecks in our education space. But how do we navigate through these challenges to help us be successful, as Zane Safa has talked about? If you're just joining us, this is the National Policy Dialogue on Basic Education. It's live from the Executive Theatre here at TV3. We're live on 3FM 92.7 as well. And we'll see a number of your questions already on, on Facebook. So we would get on to it as we go on. We want to acknowledge a few persons who are here as well. The students of the University of Professional Studies here in Accra, UPSA, are here. Let's put our hands together for them. Thank you very much. We have a representative from the Ghana National Association of Teachers, NAT. Thank you, sir. Um, I don't see Inokwesi Jetua here, but if there's someone who represents the Ghana National Council of Private Schools, please... Okay. A representative of Inclusion Ghana, Jalil Odum. Any 
Okay. Child Rights International, any rep from there? Child Rights International? Okay. And if we have the CEO of Leiden Educational Consultants in London, Dr. James Owusu, please let's put our hands together. I would be acknowledging more of uh, representatives here as we go on. We also have a rep from Plan International. Plan International, also someone from the Coalition Against the Privatization and Commercialization of Education. Fantastic. Thank you. That's Kapkoi. Kapkoi. Kapko. Okay. If we have a representative from ActionAid, great. Fantastic. Thank you. Also, Nana Afra Sika Mensa, Deputy National Coordinator, Free Senior High School Secretariat. Thank you very much for coming. And that's why Chrissy was talking about free SHS life, <laughs> because you're here. But yes, that leads us into our plenary session. And please prepare your questions. We would be um, coming to you, the audience. Um, but while we are at it, we we'll, would we'll move this shortly. But a number of things have been said, even in the opening remarks. It gives us an idea of where we are and what should be done going forward to ensure that we're able to improve on the education space that we have it. Yes, net enrollment has improved 92 percent obviously one of the highest in the sub-region we're told but in there there are challenges and that is the transition rate that Kofi talked about so if you have in the rural communities Kwesi, children who start from kindergarten and by JHS just three out of ten can transit into senior high school. If you make senior high school free, seven, all things being equal, would, would not benefit, right? And, and, and nationwide, maybe if you look at the, the urban communities, you would have just about six and a half, maybe maximum seven out of 10 transiting or progressing to the senior high school from the kindergarten level. What is being done to ensure that while you are making senior high school free, you are also improving on the access to the senior high school for especially rural folks at the basic level. Okay, uh, Alfred, thank you very much. And I think this is also a very valid point or question that you've raised. And I mean, largely is a conversation between, I mean, access and quality. Uh, because, I mean, if you look at, for instance, uh, the analogy of female uh, initially, a lot of this access is curtailed largely uh, on account that there are, in terms of even the junior high schools, there are about 4,000 uh, primary schools that do not have their corresponding uh, junior high schools. And of course, as a ministry, we've also taken notice of that and accordingly, uh, we've made some significant interventions towards that. One has to do with the introduction of the uh, 21st century modern junior high schools. Because the point is that if we have, for instance, 21st century modern, modern junior, junior, high junior high schools. Yes. What's I mean, that? Uh, the, the junior high school of the state of art uh, building that obviously factors uh, science laboratories, uh, biology lab, you have chemistry lab, you have physics lab, you have a computer lab. And so the plan is that, I mean, if you want to do the cost benefit analysis, you have a first option of, for instance, providing this facility for all 4,000 schools, which will be quite difficult for a government to do. The other option is that you may, uh, I mean, like Peter rightly indicated, decommission some schools. For instance, if you go to Dublin, for instance, there is one that is currently ongoing you may decommission about 12 schools and then put these students into one school. That gives you that fiscal space to be able to provide science laboratories for these same students in terms of the biology, physics, and the chemistry lab. All of what you have to do is some way, somehow, uh, secure, let's say, transportation arrangement for this case. So instead of building 4,000 schools, you may end up building like 300 schools, and that becomes much more easier for government. And this project has also started, like I indicated, with that of the 
uh, Jabin. There's also one at Asim. But, but is, it, is, it, is it that straightforward? I mean, Kofi, on that particular point, is it, is it that straightforward that with, with this, that is going to help in ad addressing this? I just want to have Kofi's quick intervention on this. Anyone. My understanding is that what he mentioned is supposed to be a pilot uh, for us to study and see how it can help us. It can help prevent us from building 4,000 junior high schools that may not have the full complement of science laboratories, etc. But you see, we find ourselves at this place because in the past, in the past three, four decades, we were, using, we were looking for the easiest way out. And that's why we find ourselves here. And again, we are exploring another easy way out by saying that we don't have the fiscal space. And so we want to merge 12 schools together and build one junior high school for them. So we don't have money. We don't have, yeah, we don't have money. That's the fiscal space. But the reality is that it may sound cost efficient fiscal in the short term. Okay, I'm, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about the fiscal space because but, but the only sense this approach has, makes. Okay, the only sense this approach makes is economic efficiency. I mean, economic efficiency. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper to build one junior high school for ten different junior high schools to attend. Okay, but we are we have we are using money to solve a social problem. And what's the social problem? I've explained to you that even at the primary level. This town to school is the major cause of school dropout. And according to UNICEF, only 5.5 .5 out of 10 children who start KG1 are completing primary six, even at primary school. So the distance to primary school is a major contributing factor for dropout. So anytime you bring an intervention, that seeks to prolong that distance mm -hmm. from that primary school to a central junior high school somewhere, then you are not taking full cognizance of the fact that distance is the number one variable when it comes to schools dropout. Mm. It's easy to say that in urban areas, you can provide buses. Yes. Not to talk about the history of genius in maintaining buses in the less than thousands of public senior high schools. Mm. I can tell you that it is not practicable. And even if it is, in my weirdest imagination, should it happen, you realize that if you have to provide buses for students around Medina who attend junior high school at Presec or at a central location, the meaning is that you have averagely 200 students in a junior high school, one, two, three, averagely 200 students. So the 10 junior high schools will have at least 2,000. Mm -hmm. Providing buses means that providing buses to ferry 2,000 students, in, that's just one school, one model that's school, 2,000 students. You will need at least 10 buses. Mm -hmm. How is it going to work? Because there's no history of any maintenance of even buses in senior high schools. Mm -hmm. And again, beyond the maintenance of these buses, the reality is that we all know in rural areas, mm -hmm. the reason why children struggle to commute and drop out, and for which reason distance is more a barrier to transition and completion than in urban areas, is because the roads are not even there for alternative commu um, co commuting through, trans uh, through um, 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 vehicular transport. Mm -hmm. So they walk. So how are you going to do that? So I think that, yes, the approach is beautiful on paper because uh -huh. economically, instead of building 4,000 new junior high schools, that will have ICT labs and science labs. Mm -hmm. You build only 400. Okay, economically, you will save costs. But I dare say that what this government does not have, and I'm talking about the government of Ghana, not this particular administration, what the government of Ghana does not have is not 1.2 million Ghana cities to build a three unit junior high school, a science lab, and an ICT lab for 4,000 schools. We can do that with less than 6 billion cities. And what we do not have is not 6 billion cities. We, we, we can afford 6 billion cities and a get fund within two years. And so the problem is not the lack of the fiscal space to provide them for charter. The problem is the commitment to look for a sustainable solution to this and not a shortcut. That, for me, is the issue. Very important. So how are you going to solve? Because, you see, the issues Kokofi has raised questions the approach that you are talking about. So as germane as they are, how are you going to ensure that this, this approach also addresses the, the fundamental concerns that Kofi has raised? I mean, I mean, even before to answer your question, I, I don't know how this whole moderation is going to turn out. Because if at every point my presentation will have to be cut for somebody, so I don't know whether same k will be extended to me. Because oh, indeed. It, I mean, it be. But it, will be, it becomes very difficult for me to make the point. But anyway, that said, you see, the point is that you 
I mean, I just want to just throw a, a question back to Kofi. Today, we have primary schools with average, I mean, 1,000 students, 1,500 students. How are they able to transport their students to school? The private schools that uh, they have their organized buses. Mm -hmm. You see, we shouldn't make the conversation so simplistic and close ended and paint a narrative as though uh, when they say buses are picking students to school, it picks them or maybe within 30 minutes. And if you miss that 30 minutes range, that is all. That's not how it works. The, and again, as of now, even there are even public basic schools that are still practicing the class system. How do the students also get to school? Are they also not from different vicinities? Of course, in building, you, you may have to also factor the proximity uh, factors into it. So it is not as though, uh, if we are going to, for instance, decommission schools in, or where currently one of these current uh, junior high model schools is being constructed. You may, for instance, look at schools that are within certain wide proximity that even you may not even uh, have students working to the school. Of course, there's a balance of both. You may have students working to school. At the same time, you provide buses for some of these students to also be in school. So, you see, so the, the point is that you're going to provide buses for, for schools to transport students that live far to come to school. No, you see, part of it. The, yes, the idea, is that, the idea is that you have an option to build 4,000 schools. But you see, building 4,000 schools, you may have to provide, I mean, these laboratories that I spoke about, biology, uh, physics, uh, chemistry. At the same time, even such a school will still need school management. Such a school will still even, will, may, need, may be necessary that you still have to provide a bus. Okay. And so what we are saying is that if there is a problem, and the problem is that when 4,000 uh, out of 4,000 schools, students complete school and they are unable to get access because there are no corresponding junior high schools, why don't you in a creative or innovative way for instance, decommission some of these schools so that in terms of quality, you'll be able to enhance and provide what, that's why the schools are termed 21st century schools. You'll be able to provide all the necessary materials and logistics for that particular school in terms of ensuring school management, school, school leadership, whilst you provide a bus for students that are unable to access. So it is not as though if you say 2,000 students, all the 2,000 students are going to move uh, through the bus system. Of course, in terms of proximity reasons, if, for instance, in a, in a place like Onye, in a place like Bantama, in a place like Chibi, you are still going to get majority of them to be able to access the school, even just by uh, walking to the schools. So that was the point that I, I, I wanted to make. But beyond that, mm -hmm. I think like we were speaking, we were talking about uh, the, the, in terms of uh, quality uh, provisions at the basic schools, the interventions that the Ministry of Education has been able to do all in all. I indicated, I mean, one significant point about also improving quality. Of course, when quality is also enhanced, that is where you also be able to get these students uh, pushed up to the senior high school level. One also has to do with the introduction of the national standardized test. I don't know if you are aware about it, because literally, uh, I mean, previously, when you had about just 2% of our students within primary two, which were able to just read and write. But with the introduction of the national standardized test, at every point, you are able to text them, know their proficiency level, know their capabilities and competencies when it comes to the arithmetics, and you are able to provide interventions to them. So some of these problems, I mean, some of these interventions. So what has the national standardized test done exactly? I mean, what problem has it solved? So like I said, what the national standardized test seeks to do is to be able to, in terms of uh, students that are unable to read, that are unable to write. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the foundations of learning largely has to border on reading, a border on writing, a border on numeracy. And so if these students are even unable to get these basic foundations right, certainly they are not going to uh, progress up to the, uh, I mean, the subsequent levels and even proceed to GHS or uh, senior high school. So what we did as a ministry, as part of the quality ensuring measures, is also be able to assess them at a very basic level. Because, see, at every point, the tradition has always been that you have to get these students move up to JHS level, about 11 years in school before you are able to test them. By the time you test them when they go and write the BEC, then providing an intervention will be so late. But a lot of times, they are just exiting the schools. So they will complete BEC all right, but a lot of them will not be able to pass. Also, affecting even our enrollment be beyond the BEC or the JHS level. So what we felt that the ministry, that it was important that we provide 
an intervention at an early stage. So if you are in class two, you will write the national standardized test. And based on the assessment that we are able to do, we we'll provide an intervention. The intervention could be the provision of books. The, for instance, let's say if you go to a region like uh, maybe Asante region, mm -hmm. and you realize that in terms of numeracy, they are not doing well. What you have to do is then ask questions. If it has to do with the teaching methods, if it has to do with uh, providing uh, some form of training for the teachers, if you have to do providing certain critical interventions that you provide. So these are all, like, like well, I indicated, these are all some of the uh, factors that is also going to Im help improve quality. Of course, I mean, I'm London. Still on, on, on improvement of access and also quality at the basic school level. Uh, there is currently a program called under Gallup. And Gallup has identified more than 10,000 schools where they are, I mean, those are largely low-performing mm -hmm. basic schools, particularly if you look at the rural schools within the rural communities. We target them, uh, provide special interventions in terms of teaching and learning materials, in terms of training of teachers, okay. in terms of providing learning grants, so that we also be able to enhance and their learning outcomes also at the basic level. Right. Now, Ms. Ante, I'll bring you, because I know that um, this national standardized test or exams, we have had a conversation on this before, because I asked about what it is supposed to solve, because after the, after the test, th then what? So, Kwesi talks about provision of textbooks to solve certain problems. There are some of the basic schools that don't have the textbooks that, that we're even talking about right now. Some of them have one, others have four based on your report, Kofi, that you put out there. So what exactly has been the impact based on your analysis of this national standardized test? Hmm. Uh, to be frank, um, you see, the problem that we have in our education system, I think it's more about implementation. Because NST is one of the wonderful ideas that came with the standard-based curriculum. Because the standard-based curriculum sets standards. So at basic two, there are certain standards that a student is supposed to exhibit. So you write your NST at basic two, and then we send the reports back to the school for the teacher to know the standards, those who are meeting the standards and those who are not meeting the standards. Then the student moves to basic three, and then there is a remedial measure to ensure that those who were not able to meet the standards are taken through certain processes so that they will be able to meet the standard. That was the original plan of the NST. The NST was designed as a diagnostic kind of examination. It was not supposed to be that kind of external exams which is supposed to be conducted by an external body like WIEC, and then we clustered them at one place like they are writing BEC. The original idea of the NST was not that because it was tied to the standard, uh, the standard curriculum. Unfortunately, when it came to implementation, we, we, we messed it up. So as it, as it stands now, we, we are supposed to have NST written for basic two, NST written for basic four, NST written for basic six, and then NST written for junior high school um, two, or what we call basic eight. But we've not been able to do that after implementing the standard-based curriculum. So I think that sometimes we get these ideas. What our policy people do, I mean, the, the managers of education do is that for them, because they are politicians, they look at how to tick the boxes. We say we will do this, we've done it. We say we'll do this, we've done it. But they don't follow through to see the impact of the policy as it was originally designed to ensure that we are getting the benefits of that particular policy uh, uh, as it's supposed to be. So, uh, Alfred, mm -hmm. yes, NST is good. We were supposed to implement it in a certain way to get the needed levels of standards that our students were reaching in terms of numeracy and literacy. And even going forward, we could have even expanded to cover certain other subject areas. And then we could have piled up the data in, from the students from basic two, basic three up to GHS2, where you have a longitudinal data of a particular student across all the, uh, I mean, across board for all the uh, uh, students in the country. Then you can make informed decision about the student's capability and ability in terms of placement and all those things. We felt in doing that. Uh, so, that, that, so that, no, no, you are not doing that. You are not doing no. So, what, what, is are, the, what is the essence so of the test? When was the last time no, that I'm the NST that, okay, data on, got back to the, the school? At the end of the day. At the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where, where is the results no, of the no, P4 NST that was done two years ago? I don't want us to do this. I don't want us to do this. There is a difference. So, can I say, can I say, can I respond? Okay, can I respond? Hold on, gentlemen. There is a difference. There's a specific question about, you see, when you do a test, obviously, you would have to get an outcome or a result that would inform the decisions that you take 
in terms of the policy interventions that you talk about. So were there results four years ago for, for that test? Do, do you have it? I, I mean, is Peter suggesting that when the students wrote the exams, they were not marked? Okay, I mean, all right. You, no. You, Peter, no, Peter, 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 listen. Peter, you see, oh, okay, hold on. This is not supposed here. to be a back and forth thing. Yes, we want the, we sit the best for the sector. And our main rule and responsibility okay, is to find problem in every aspect of what the ministry is doing. We will be able to okay. find. Okay, that's what we are okay. doing. Let's, Peter, go, go, go. Yeah, so, 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 hold, on, hold on, hold on. You hold see, on. The, the, the point Peter, is that Peter, the first yes. NST that was conducted. I'm learning from you. Okay, okay, okay. Hold on, hold on. Yes, thank you. The first NS that was conducted, we came to announce it. And then we were told that a certain school, a certain region was first. That was not the original. You, you see, we, let's go back to the original that document. Was okay. That was not the original okay. purpose of the NST. You see, the original purpose of the NST is to give feedback to the school, the teacher, the teacher, the, the students, and and based on that feedback, you design interventions as he was talking about. So you design those interventions to meet the needs of that student who was not able to meet the set standard. Now they wrote another one at basic four, and as, as at now, those results are not in the schools. I've told you that I don't want to do this here because we want to have a nice discussion. But if you want us to point to the public, some of the weaknesses in the system in terms of implementation, fact, well, that's then why we we, are here. we're going to do that. You don't mm -hmm. have the results in the schools. You are now treating the NST as another form of BEC, and that is not the original focus of the NST. I see. Thank you. Can I, okay, can I you, respond? Well, let, let's pause, and um, please, let's put our hands together for them. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we respond. We respond. Okay, I'll come to the audience in a bit, but Anis, oh, Anis, with, with, with this um, conversation, in the end, it, it's all about, for instance, developing on the systems and structures. You see, the NSD, one of the objectives that Kwesi talked about was to respond with the right pedagogical skills so that the teacher can also be able to respond to the specific needs of the student. Have you seen over the period that effort to consistently improve on the pedagogical skills of the teacher so as to meet the specific needs of the student or the pupil? You know, I think uh, this discussion uh, brings to mind the difficulty of uh, the fiscal infrastructure in the whole country, especially when you talk about moving students from one end to the other, transportation. And it's the same problem that farmers do face. So we, 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 need, we have very difficult infrastructural concerns. Now, again, this is the digital era. So I'm beginning to look at how we can begin to use uh, digital, digitalization to make things a bit easier. You know, so uh, I'm looking at ways in which we can make life also a lot simpler for our teachers. And I'm looking at ways in which, for example, the, the STEM programs that we're doing and STEAM programs and so on, it will, be, um, it will be impossible to cite these important things all over the country. I don't think we'll be able to afford it. However, if we can have a few in the, in the different districts, in the different constituencies, then we have to find ways in which we can beam the successes of these, uh, uh, how do you call it, of these labs into the various schools. But then we need to uh, kick in uh, uh, digital uh, platforms, you know, the idea is this, how do we make teachers' life easier for them? I think that's the most important thing. They need to have access to it. I remember a training that I did in Tamale, you know, and I'm trying to tell them about the difficulties of having uh, teachers who don't have the means to be successful. Where we have teachers' uh, heads, we are looking at promoting teachers for regional district levels and so on. And they come to you, and some of them have not even seen computers before. It was very difficult, you know, and then, but meanwhile, they want promotion. So what I'm saying is this, you need to really, like what I said earlier, you need to really add value to yourself and invest in some uh, digital uh, proficiency. So that can help you. But at the end of the day, um, from where we are now, we have to cut the physical barriers as much as possible and, and do how we can uh, involve uh, digital methods in our, in our assessment, in training and everything else. But in a country, we don't have a choice but to get to be innovative sometimes. 
And once you start being innovative, you're going to have problems because we have to begin to solve these problems. But what I will say is this. I was invited by the uh, Minister, of Minister of Education, uh, Dr. Aduchum, to see what it is that he was doing about some change. It was so impre impressive. I've never seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. Where the old buildings were removed completely and new buildings was there. And I was there right from the beginning. The, later on, when I saw it, I mean, it, it gives one's hope. But the most important thing is that we have to now transition from analog means to digital means so that we all have access to the same kind of information and so on. This will have to kick in. It doesn't matter which party is in power. Mm -hmm. The only thing is this. The, the concern that I have is that we start something, another person comes, they, they almost destroy what was started, we start all over again, another group comes and so on. There has to be some element of continuity. And these days with digital means, I, I don't think we should be having the problem that we used to have in the old days in the analog means. Absolutely. And you see, let's um, acknowledge them, please. Let's put our hands together for them. <laughs> to be honest, I mean, talk about continuity is part of our directive principles of state policy, even in our constitution, continuity. But every government wants to be known for something. So instead of continuing previous government projects, we always want to start something new. Because you wanted just a quick response to, to the specific issues that, that were raised about, especially the national standardized test that, that Peter, uh, Dr. Peter Patianti uh, pointed out to. Yeah. That yes, it was an intervention, beautiful as it's, it, 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 the, the, the objectives were, but then the outcomes is where the challenge is right now. Yeah, I mean, so I just wanted to point out that we need to understand the whole essence of administering that test. And the essence is not to generate results and send it back for the schools, of course, for the purposes of ranking. That is not the essence of the national standardized test. The essence okay. of the national standardized test is to be able to pick feedback on how well the students are faring when it comes to the curriculum that was introduced, I mean, referring to the standard-based curriculum. And so that the outcome of that test, policymakers, it will guide policymakers, of course, in the allocation of resources, mm -hmm. uh, in providing interventions, in, I mean, for future planning, and uh, for all subsequent policy decisions. So if Peter is saying that uh, the test has been administered We've not been able to provide the results to the school. I just want to remind him that the purpose of the test is not to be able to provide results, rank it, and send it back to the schools. Okay. It's only to say that, well, in Asante region, if you look at, for instance, these districts, they are not doing well when it comes to mass. What is accounting for that? What intervention can the ministry do? And then we provide such intervention. The purpose is not to give results back to them. All right. So the policymakers, I was just having a conversation with uh, Professor Edward Apia, and he was even asking which of the data that I require. Because okay. so far as the ministry is concerned, we've got the right data. And based on that, we are also providing, I mean, the uh, interventions that has to be gone I, I accordingly. Okay. Thank you. Now, Kofi, the, the issue is about improving on systems. So, yes, if the policy had good objectives, but then again, I mean, the NSD, the outcomes is what, what we are talking about now. What can be improved upon to ensure that these objectives are achieved efficiently? Um, I won't talk about the NST because um, um, it's become a contention. I'm not sure we can it's make progress. It's become a know. contention. I mean, the least we should be doing is to be having contentious argument around mm. something that is obvious, you understand? So. But what's um, obvious about it is, in fact, it's one of the objectives of this conversation. Yeah, so the conversation should be on how to improve on the NST. Indeed. The NST. But if even the essence of the NST is, is now in dispute, then it becomes a challenge. You know, we thought we were, we were going towards the east, and our problem was how to mobilize enough energy to work towards the east. Now, we have been told that the, the journey is actually to the west. So, but so I mean, it becomes, so, so, it's not you. No, it's not you. Hold on, hold on. No, when you No, relax. I know, relax. I have the right to ask questions when you are speaking. You can't interject. I interjected to have him speak. So, respectfully, when you were talking, 
Because let's, you see, let's, but why please, do you keep quiz, quiz, your, your quiz, quiz, let's, your let's, 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 let's maintain some decorum. Because see, the NSC is supposed to guide both the educator and then the policymaker. The policymaker doesn't work in the classroom. Okay, and so the NSC is supposed to guide the educator, the teacher in the classroom, you know, give them information about the attainment levels of the people they are teaching in respect of the key competencies that they are supposed to meet. Where are the gaps? How do you reinforce your pedagogic skills and other skills you need so that they are able to meet that gap before they move to the next grade? So if I do NSC in class two, the result of NSC in class two should feed into my class three teacher's intervention in the classroom so that I bridge those gaps before I get to class four for the next NST. We've done NST for class four two years ago. The class four guys are going to class six. The result is not in the school. And we raise it and you say that the policymaker in a what is the policymaker in a crowd doing with what is happening in class class four in Miku Chrome in Kifuhimai? I don't get it. So let's 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 focus on the core issue. This one's a peripheral issues. So as far as I'm concerned, we all know that we are going towards the east. Let's move towards the east. Chief, I want to emphasize that. I agree with Anis that yes, it is beautiful to have nice edifices, 21st century schools legacy projects, you know, innovative projects, it is beautiful. I am saying that from my little two, two and a half decade years of experience working in the sector, I have no evidence, I have no data, I have no facts, and I have no reasonable basis to believe that the Ghana Education Service can provide buses to ferry public basic school students from primary schools to cluster junior high schools because Two years ago and last year, the same GES was struggling to give even 5,000 Ghana cities to district directorates to run the district education office for the whole year. So let's not kid ourselves. The GES that struggles to buy fuel in buses of less than 1,000 senior high schools can suddenly buy about 3,000 buses and fuel them every day to ferry to students from Chiaboso to Chifopraso to attend the course. It's not possible. Let's not have that discussion. Okay. Let's be realistic with our challenges, and let's be realistic with the resources we have. Okay? One model might be convenient for Onye, and I know Onye very well. I know that the district very well. One model may fit within Onye. One model may fit in some part of Medina, where you have the cluster of schools. The cluster of schools. One model may fit, may be fit because you can have eight clusters around within five kilometers. But the point I want to make is that, assuming that you have 4,000 junior high schools to build. But because you don't have money, you want to go and build 400 and collapse 10 into one and add them to attend this school. If that is your approach, then it is overly simplistic because it's not based on data on the ground. Because data on the ground will tell you that the average public primary school student walks to school. And so once they are supposed to prolong the distance they walk to school, you are, you are, you, you, you are, you are fueling dropout because even as they walk to primary school, the major cost of their dropout, which is about three, or three and a half out of 10 dropping out in Ghana, and 5.5 dropping out by P6 in the northern regions. Okay, If you prolong that already precarious um, uh, challenge, and you say, continue the five kilometers and do it eight kilometers and assess a beautiful state of the art school, I'm saying that the child will not survive that distance. And so let's be purposive in this approach. The straight jacket will not work. For okay, Ghana. thank you. I would have uh, Dr. James Owusu make uh, some comments quickly before we proceed. Let's put our hands together for Dr. Thank you very much. And, um, Thank you, um, panelists, for the fantastic, um, you know, submissions that you've made. Um, I was listening to all of you. You made fantastic points. And I think what we're looking here is moving our children is a journey from school to employment. The bottom line is to give them the education they need and the skills for them to be effectively contribute to the socioeconomic development of the nation. And every single one of us here want our children to do well. So that is the bottom line. 
Now, we are in a 21st century. We're not in 19th century. Things are evolving. And we need to have a system that works for Ghana. We need to have 21st century skills for 21st century jobs. So the young people that we are producing, we need to make sure they have the skills they need. Now, um, Kofi, you mentioned the, um, the disparity in the rural urban sector where young children cannot access junior high school because of distance. Now, COVID have shown us that education can even be done. Skills can be, can be acquired, even in your bedroom. So we need to come up with innovative and you know, constructive way in educating our young people. Let me give you one example to solve that problem. I did a program in Adelaide, in Australia. The first school in the world in a university called Flintoff University, where they have a virtual school for uh, Aborigines in an area where they don't have access. They have to travel distance. If you've ever been to the northern part of Australia, where the Aborigines live, desert, very long, long distance. Now, they set up a digital platform. And I'm so happy that the government is looking at digitization. Giving young people laptops or, um, you know, tablets, integrating the curriculum, integrating resources in so that they can access education, which is a good thing. So the problem that we mentioned about the distant factor, we can also look into setting up, using all these platforms, creating a learning hub for children who cannot access junior high school, traveling long distances to access education. It wow. can be done. And then finally, you were talking about uh, textbooks. 65% textbooks distributed so far. And some schools don't have. Everything should be digitized. We can have a digitized textbook where you don't need to be buying the physical textbook distributing it into schools. The tablets that have been distributed, can, we can integrate the textbooks in the tablet, and children can use it. Two, three people can access it on the tablet in a classroom to do their learning and, 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 and stuff. And finally, we were talking about 400 dropouts. That's staggering. 400,000 dropouts, that's staggering, of children not in... Uh, school and one point something million children who are not in school, in training, in employment, and nothing. Now, what can we do to absorb all these people? And that is why I'm so happy about digitization. We can have an online integrated program where we work with the employers. You were talking about digitization. We can use all the different facets of our educational system, yes, working with employers, using a digital system where children can access education without physically being in a classroom and working with employers to acquire the skills they need. Okay. And that is the bottom line Thank you. of what we're Thank doing. Thank you very now. much. Let's put Thank our hands you. together for Doc. And just a quick one. Let me just do this quickly. Okay. We are live on no. We are live on TV. We are live on TV three. Also on three FM ninety two point seven. We've got to take a quick break on TV because we're going for the twelve o'clock news, um, as well as on radio as well. So, but we're going to be live on on our various uh, social media platforms. So, thank you to the audience on TV. Thank you very much. And this is the National Policy Dialogue on Basic Education, live from the Executive Theatre here at TV3, with funding support from Star Ghana Foundation and helping us to do this. So we'll cross over to the news right now. Mr. Nisafa, a quick right. point, and uh, then we'll go to the audience. You know, that, what you say brings me to mind. Mm -hmm. I lived in a, a place in Kumail called Crowfroom. I walked from Crowfroom to Mbro, walked through Ashantulu town, crossed the, ridge, uh, uh, the railway tracks, and climb up the Roman Ridge, seven kilometers. And I walk all the way back. 
the point I'm raising is this. We cannot continue doing things the same way that we used to be done. So that if you want uh, infrastructure, there's no way Ghana can be able to afford infrastructure that will take care of every school going age from Accra to Wa. It's not going to happen. So what I'm saying is that digital platforms have to be uh, introduced. Okay. But the issue I have is this. Here we have in a system where we have analog teachers teaching a digital generation. These are the, some of the things that we have to take into consideration because you'd be surprised. While our teachers might not be digital savvy, the children are. Mm. And that in, in itself is a motivation to not go to school. Okay. So what I'm saying, we have to begin to look at 21st century, like what the gentleman is saying, Perfect. and, and skip the uh, stone by stone walking to particular places. We okay. can do better than that. We have some time, so we'll all have the time to ask our questions. So let's not be too agitated. Yes. Okay, um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, today I'm very honored because education... If we can kindly go straight to the okay, question. Okay, so um, my name is Nanaj Prempe, an education activist. Um, I will touch on the financing and when it comes to education to ensure quality and other stuff, it boils down to financing. Uh, government is doing well. Uh, let me use the opportunity to commend the minister, Dr. Yossi Duchum, in mitigating uh, some of the challenges but you could see that government is overburdened. Let, me, let us be sincere to ourselves. When it comes to the GET Fund, you could see that it has increased from 12% to 20% to the basic education. Uh, you could see there has been some effort, but still, it doesn't tackle the challenge that we have. Gallup is doing, uh, helping us. Um, you talk about Arab Development Fund trying to put up some project for the basic school. But still, let us look at the sustainable uh, measures. And I believe that the district assemblies, the IGF, 10% is not adequate for them to provide basic infrastructure or let me say furniture to the schools. So I am of the view that they should, um, I think 2021, we had some mem members of parliament who tabled a motion that um, corporate social responsibility, there should be a legal backing. I am of the view that if you go to advanced countries, we have corporate social responsibility, or let me say corporate entities trying to also help some, some of the dilapidated environment, or let me say schools in our remote areas. So I'm, I am of the view that that law or that bill should be passed into law. So that areas, for instance, if you go to Kenya and say Newmont, for instance, we shouldn't have problem with students sitting under trees. Thank you. So that's my point. Thank you Thank very you. much. Can someone help me with a microphone, passing the microphone on? Yes. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, just to register. Please mention your name. My and name where is Dr. Work. Violet Makuku. I'm a Zimbabwean, but here for nine years, I've been a diplomat here for African Union. I'm now the director for the Global Quality Assurance Association with a strong education background, curriculum background, and so on. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm the first woman to speak, but uh, can I register my displeasure that even on the panel, no lady. Next time we are talking of SDGs, can we make sure that we address that? Secondly, I want to come straight to the issues. One of the key issues I want to register is that Ghana, the citizens themselves are enemies of themselves because somebody stated that each government, when it comes, it wants to register what it has done. It's the pressure from the citizens. I've experienced it. Hey, this was started by my ama. Dodangwa should start his own, blah, blah. This was started by... That language, it's the same taxpayer's money. We want effective succession. And we want this to be done by people who are permanent in offices. You know that is where the gap is. One minister comes, he or she goes, goes with everything. Let's have the people who are permanently employed to handle some of these issues. But moving forward, let me quickly talk about uh, uh, the issues that I have. Honestly, I've been listening to Joy News. I've been listening to... so. If I were to vie for presidents in 2024... Everybody was going to vote for me to be a president in Ghana. Can I tell you why? They are real issues. The problem is we cannot disentangle politics from real issues. And once we do that, we are going to solve our issues. What is the issue? 
we all know that rural areas has been confirmed by statistics, has been confirmed throughout. There are people schooling under trees right now. And with those people, if I were to be a president, I would go to the raw areas, construct, how much do they cost? It doesn't cost much. Or construct those raw schools to reduce the distance he has talked about. The distance is true. It's very true. And you also provide a small infrastructure to the gentlemen who are talking about digitization. In the raw areas, you don't have electricity. You don't have good roads like you said. These are the real truths, hard truths. We don't have internet services. So it means this digitalization is going to further increase the access divide. Because you are still providing this for the urban people. Let's not lie to each other. These are the real facts. Then I just want to look at a lack what of proper monitoring yes. Yes. and uh, evaluation. This is an issue. We see it all the time that people initiate these things. People stay in offices, get their salaries, and they are not going out there to see what is happening. There's a lot of evidence speaking to that. Renovating schools until a school falls. Where are we? How do the wide cracks develop before? I'm not speaking of NPP. I'm not speaking of NDC because I'm a Zimbabwean. NDC came and there were schools under trees. NDC came when there were schools to be renovated. NPP came to find those things there. Let's leave the political game outside socio-economic development. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Yes. Um, let's okay. do it quickly. Thank you. So my name is Uli Eden Amadu. I work with School for Life okay. in Tamale. I want to talk about the deck situation as highlighted by Kofi, vis-a-vis um, -vis the dropout rates. So we have been working on an intervention, the CBE, the Complementary Education uh, Program, um, where yesterday we collaborated with TV3 to show a documentary on it. Um, more students are dropping out, but we're working with the CBE program to be able to bring back the students to school, those who are dropping out. Now they come back to school, and they are faced with this myriad of challenges, inadequate classrooms, and then furniture situation. I just want to throw it to Kwesi. Kwesi, uh, yes, you are doing a, no a number of things, um, but the pace at which we are going, the ESP, if you do not accelerate the progress, if you do not accelerate our actions or our effort, we may not be able to uh, meet the SDG and then the ESP targets that we have set for ourselves. Yesterday, we were in a school in the Nantong area, a, mo a girls' model junior high school. This is supposed to be a, a model junior high school, but they lack furniture. Mm -hmm. There are about 115 girls in the school, and the furniture or the decks are not enough. Just 115. So, Kosi, I want to throw, throw, throw this question to you to see how you can accelerate your effort or actions towards providing these schools the furniture to address the furniture challenges Thank you. in the Kosi, school. Let's uh, Thank have you. a quick response to that, and then the yeah, other I'm, issues I'm, that have come I'm up, sure and then we'll take the next. I'll get the data for you. No, but uh, yes. So on the furniture uh, issue, um, I, I'll be the first to admit that we've had a furniture issue for some time, for a long time. And by 2017, 30% of children in basic schools did not have access to furniture according to the required protocol, sitting protocols of the GES. It increased to 40% from 2018. Um, but recently we've seen an acceleration in the effort by the Ministry of Education to provide resources for the procurement of furniture. Apparently it was about waiting for the local governments to respond to the need. But many local governments, including the ones in the districts you are referring to, and Gushegu, where we were you know, weeks ago, are so low on IGF that if we left the responsibility of providing furniture to them, they will struggle. And so I have seen, I'm aware that Get Fund has procured some furniture from the allocation of last year. I'm also aware that in the current, the recently approved Get Fund formula, we have 100 million Ghana cities being allocated for furniture. If the 100 million Ghana cities being allocated for furniture goes to procure decks, we should solve the furniture problem by a third. Because we estimate that we need 330 million 
to solve the furniture situation in, in the country. If we continue like this, within three years, we will solve the furniture problem. And so I think we should all direct our efforts towards the Ministry of Finance so that the Ministry of Finance will re release allocated funds and a get fund. Then we can see the furniture situation improve much more faster. Thank you okay, very much. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And the sustainable measures for financing and the proposal for district assemblies to also step in so as to take some part of the bedding from government. Quick one on that, Chrissy. Yeah, I mean, uh, so, I mean, these are, these, all of them contribute to the uh, unreported uh, budgetary expenditures mm -hmm. uh, that holistically we used to run education. For instance, you have that of the district assemblies come on funds. Uh, for instance, even if you look, look at uh, the education budget, for instance, uh, the reported one largely borders on the Ministry of Education uh, budget. Uh, but of course, if you look at, for instance, Ministry of Gender, it's not something that is uh, also taken into account. So, I mean, to have a holistic overview of the expenditure that goes into basic education, you may also have to look at even the unreported ones. But of course, I mean, there is a rule for all stakeholders, including the uh, District Assembly, uh, uh, Ministry of Gender, particularly when it comes to uh, school feeding. And of course, Ministry of Education, you also have a bit. Uh, in terms of even the, the furniture distribution, you see, I always want to situate, I mean, some of these questions in that very proper context. And what is that context? The context is that most of these challenges that we have within the education sector, particularly at the basic school level, which borders on quality, which borders on access, a lot of them are, are, are systemic challenges or systemic problems. I mean, some of them even predicts back to independence. Mm -hmm. So. You see, our, our solutions to them will, will not necessarily be like an event. Of course, if you want to access, uh, for instance, government commitment, then you will have to measure uh, government's commitment within a particular period that they've had the opportunity to serve. So yes, we may be able to solve some of the challenges. In terms of furniture, there has been several distributions. I'll get the data for you before I leave. Okay. But I mean, certainly, you also have situations where genuinely there may be schools that will be deprived with some furniture because the problem has been systemic. It's been with us for a number of years, and our solutions to them will definitely not be like an event. So yes, government will do our best, but still, you may still have some challenges that we all have to acknowledge that we have to address. Okay, thank you. Let's have, yes. Thank you. I'm Richard Kwasi Kove, but, well, convener for Campaign Against Privatization okay. and Commercialization of Education. I'm also with NAGRATS. Uh, yeah, so uh, I have a question for uh, Mr. Kwesi before I make my submission. The model junior high schools that have been built, do we have some in our front plane of our front plains north, uh, uh, Kintampo north, those, those deprived areas that actually need this, uh, uh, this in schools to ensure access? That's my, my question. If you have some, because I know of Kofudia and other places that they have started some, but the areas that actually need classroom. And then this model school, do they have it? So that, that's the question I want to But then beyond that, I want to make my submission now. You see, education is supposed to be solving problems. So when you leave the classroom, you should be able to solve problems as an individual and collectively as a nation. Now the curriculum we are running, now we, have, we are running a standard-based curriculum. If you look at the standard-based curriculum, curriculum, we are talking about 21st century competency skills that is supposed to be implemented. So we are looking at communication and collaboration, digital literacy. Now, how, how, do, how do we teach communication and collaboration in the classroom? Oh, put children in, the, in pairs, in groups. Let them have a group discussion and share. Then we think that that is communication and collaboration. No, it is not solve the first century problem. This thing, because that is the weakest form of teaching communication. At home, they, they talk with their colleagues. They, they chat with their friends. So in the classroom, when we are talking about communication and collaboration, then the, the, uh, the curriculum should be a project-based curriculum where the children undertake projects. Okay. And then we talk about digital literacy. Digital literacy, children are labeling part of a, a computer in the 21st century. That is what is in the curriculum. And they are looking at MS-DOS and all those things. When other countries are uh, teaching coding, okay. that is where the opportunities are. And so if we are not committing enough into the education, so we are only looking at the lean way to make it look like this. At the end of the day, they go and take a test paper which measure how much information the child can keep in their mind and may not even need after you leave the classroom. Thank you if that is much. what education is measuring, then we will continue to have this conversation and will be under the, the, this, uh, this thing. poor pass and forget. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for the opportunity. Let me also say that 
I'm grateful to the speakers. I am Amadou Moses Bahman Senior from the Ghana National Association of Teachers. From where I sit, I think that our problem in the education sector has to do with how we implement our policies. Why do I say that? We introduced the standard-based curriculum in 2019, which by all standards, very good. But let us ask ourselves how the teachers were prepared from the onset to go and handle the standard-based curriculum. Poorly prepared. And the standard-based curriculum was for primary one to primary six. So we started in 2019. And those who were in primary six entered junior high school in 2020. Yes. Guess what? You know when we started the Common Core curriculum in the junior high schools? In 2022. So it means that even if we take into consideration the preparation that we gave to our teachers in the primary schools and the fact that some of the peoples in the primary schools were prepared and they entering into the junior high school to go and meet the old system. So it means that there's a policy gap. And these are some of the challenges. I hold in my hand here a document called Comprehensive National Teacher Policy. I believe Mr. Kwarteng is aware of this particular document. If we can't implement this document religiously, almost all these issues we are talking about will be solved in a way. Because it talks about teacher deployment, it talks about uh, recruitment, and or even identifying that you are sending a teacher to Zabzu Tatali, maybe you need a science teacher, you need an English teacher, those kind of things, all these things should be handled. So I would want to say that as Ghanaians, we need to rethink, we need to reprioritize, we need to reposition ourselves in such a way that we can use education as a tool to develop this nation. People have maintained, and I think I share that view, that education is the oxygen of a nation. And I believe that. So let us all do away with this politicization. Okay. It's not helping us. And if we have a particular roadmap, insofar as education is concerned, teacher unions have come out with something here for all political parties to follow, insofar as their manifestos are concerned. I'm just hoping that they will pick this document and incorporate it into whatever they are going to do. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Please give me a topic, one, one of that. One. Okay. Give me, yes, yes, yes. So this is the teacher's manifesto. Yes. I see. Um, Pre-tertiary education teacher unions in Ghana. Yes. You, you brought a copy to the ministry. Yes. The pre-tertiary unions, not Nagra CCT. You've called off your strike. You are back in the classroom. Perfect. You are in the classroom. I want questions from the students and then also Madam at the back. Yes, because uh, one question was to you, Kwesi, yeah. whether you have the, any, any of the model schools yeah, in Kintampo, I mean, the Kintampo, uh, Afram Plains? The, 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 Afram Plains, eh? The, the Afram I Plains have, North. Yeah, I, have a, I have that of one in Chamba. Chamba. I have that's, Awisa. That's North, right? Yeah, a, Awisa. I have Asin in Greasy. Okay. I have Jache. Uh, that of Asim. Chief, are you listening, please? You Asim, Asim. I'm sure he's in Kumasi. Uh -huh. uh, there is also one in Sunyane. Uh, there is one in Esikado. Esikado, that's a. Esikado, Takrad, the Western Takrad, the Western region. Yeah. There is one in Onye. And there is also one in Jabin. But I'm sure we'll have to follow up and get the full details so you, for you. Uh, and uh, then. Where, where, where did you ask her? I think you also spoke uh, about technology. Afram Plains, Afram Plains North. I see. So Th thank, you, thank you for that. For our front place, not. So it's something I, you have to I, take notice I, of I, that I as well. I honestly believe that uh, all places are inclusive because if you are talking about eliminating, for instance, 4,000 schools that do not have uh, junior high schools, it's not necessarily restricted to certain parts of the region. But I'm sure with time, we'll proceed to the, the rest of uh, the other parts of the country. Perfect. I think you. I don't know if I should touch no. on the technology. Anyway. Yes, let me have the, yes. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to speak. 
My name is Nana Kunedu, and I'm the face of my department, Communication Studies Center Association, UPSA. Nana and my, yes, face please. of? Comsa, Communication Comsa. Studies Students Association, UPSA. UPSA. Yes, <coughs> thank you. And my question is directed to the spokesperson of the Minister of Education, Honorable Mr. Kwating. And this is my question. With regards to making teachers' lives easier, what policies are being put in place for teachers who have and who will be posted to rural areas to teach students? Because obviously, most teachers will reject this offer. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Because he will be very happy calling honorable because he contested for prime. He didn't win. But anyway. She, she's very prophesizing yes. to me. Yes. Hopefully, 2028. <laughs> Please. Thank you very much. My name is Thelma. I work with Action in Ghana. I'm glad Mr. Kofi has made a lot of submissions and then my other panelists as well. So when they were speaking, one of them mentioned that the problems in the schools is because of lack of monitoring and then reinforcement in our system. So I want to know, these are some challenges that the schools are facing. So is the G if the GES is aware the challenges are because there are no monitoring or reinforcement in place. What are they doing about it? I want to find out what they are doing about it. And then the issue of the standardized test. I'm very particular about that because you go to the schools and the head teachers will even tell you that they don't even know whether the student passed or not. But government has asked them to move the student to the next classroom. So they don't know if the students passed the exams or they did not do well. So if you bring a policy like the standardized test and the um, GES is saying they are not going to send the results to the school, but they are going to make policies to affect the district or something. If the teacher is not aware of the capacity or education level of the students, how are they going to know this policy is because of this standardized test that you brought about? And then I also want to talk about the digitalization. When you go to the field, in Accra here, there are schools, there are even communities that do not have network. Talk less of having data to join schools online, to join education or some class lessons online. So the, those are things that we have to do. But for now, let's try to tackle the, the issues on ground and try to make it better. Instead of looking at the long term, we know we are in the 21st century, and these are some of the things that we have to do. But please, let's look at the issues on ground and try to address them before going to those levels. The basic, thank you very the much. The basic issues, yes. yes. We, we, thank you so much. And I have the students now having their hands up so many. Please, keep the microphone. I'll come to you. Please, I'll come to you. Yeah, Kwesi, just um, the teacher support. The, yes, the teacher support, the motivation for teachers. Yes, so... Uh, there's been a facelift of uh, teacher qualification. If you recall, previously they were doing a three-year diploma program, uh -huh. but now we've converted them to uh, degree programs. Okay. What essentially also means that it's part of the uh, capacity building measures, because obviously with the, uh, the introduction of the four-year degree programs, they are, what, whatever skills and knowledge that they acquire is going to be enhanced. What it means is that this time around, if they are also teaching your teachers, uh, your, your students, they are teaching them as degree holders. Of course, no disrespect to uh, diploma holders, but certainly is an upgrade of what they used to formally be. The center of the be, question here was... I'm just adding one. Yeah. If you, if you, if you, the, also, the introduction of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, how do you call it? The NTC, you know, they require them to write an exams. Mm -hmm. So, more or less, it has uh, internationalized what they are doing because... What it means is that if you... You mean the licensure exam? Yeah, the licensure exam. What it means is that if you write the licensure exams and you pass, uh, it essentially means that you are also able to compete with the rest of other teachers. For instance, I mean, just during the COVID time, if you recall, we, Barbados and other countries were recruiting uh, nurses from, from Ghana, largely because we belong to a whole international community because we're standardized. So it's also an, another measure that we introduced. And of course, that of te technology deployment also among the teachers. I think my, my senior also raised that yes, uh, point. But the other issue she raised was the motivation to have teachers go to rural communities, correct, to, to teach. So that, I mean, if you want somebody to go to Kintampo North, what's the motivation for them to, to accept to, to go there and teach well? 
Yeah, I mean, so largely, the, the plan is that previously, if you look at previously what we, we, I mean, the system that we were used to, what happens is that you may be posting a teacher from, for instance, Accra to Borga. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, they don't have families there, they don't have homes there, so it becomes very difficult. So right now, we've quite, uh, I mean, changed the face of the recruitment and the posting process. So for instance, we now use indigents of that particular place. I mean, those are people that have lived there, that are very comfortable there, and that ordinarily were set postings there. So for instance, instead of posting somebody from Greater Accra to my hometown, Domiabra, it, it rather make, it makes sense for you to post somebody who is from maybe around the Santiago Enclave there, because that person is likely to accept posting without necessarily the conditions of having even to motivate that person. Or not. And very briefly, or finally on, on the technology de deployment, particularly for teachers too, yes. it's something that we've done. If you recall the introduction of the one teacher, one laptop policy, I mean, before that, even there were some uh, level of training for them before the introduction of that policy, and also that has also phased out to be quite well. Okay, there was a question about the standardized test, which we have gone on and on about. Yes, hey, Chris, 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 sorry. About the motivation, I want to emphasize the motivation. There is no motivation for teachers to accept to teach in yes. deprived areas of this country. Yes. There's no see, motivation. Yeah, when, when you say motivation, then it means that the teacher in that area is getting something mm -hmm. that the teacher in Accra is not getting. Right. That motivation is not there at present. Within the, within the conditions of service that the teachers are currently um, negotiating government on, mm -hmm. is a percentage of their salary to be paid as deprived teacher allowance. It has been That's on the table since 2009. Since 2009? Yes. In fact, the first recommendation was in an environment such report in 2006 or so. And we've been playing, we've, we've been talking about ah, it. We've seen very, very concrete commitments made by this administration. We thought it would have been concluded by 2020. We've got it to 2024. We want to see that 20% allowance for teachers who teach in these deprived communities implemented as part of their condition of service. Then there will be a motivation that if I accepted to go and teach in Perodia, I will get 20% more than my colleague who is teaching in Cape Coast. Other than that, they are at present, they earn the same salary. If they get laptops, the guys in the urban areas also get laptops. And we'll continue to have a situation where you have one teacher teaching from KG to primary six, like the school in Afran Plains. Because there's no motivation. They were four last year. Now they are one. There's no motivation. The second thing is that, over time, even though the policy of the Ministry of Education has been and part of the, one of the pillars of the reform to decentralize teaching management, we are first recentralizing a lot of things in the sector. We have centralized teacher deployment. Now we are posting teachers from GN headquarters to schools. And it has created a situation in some schools where you find overpopulation of teachers in particular schools and scarcity of teachers in other schools. We need to go back to the old system where district directors were in charge of that. So that, I agree, that the genius had issues with district directors who were not efficient in distributing teachers. Some of them were overpopulating teachers in urban schools in their districts and depriving the rural schools there. We know that that system was quite also corrupted. But the point is that to simply say that because district directors have failed, or some of them have failed to effectively distribute teachers in their districts. You are taking that power to Accra. For me, it's a mark of failure because it is the responsibility of the, district, the regional and then the GS secretaries to ensure that those district directors in the first place do not fail. Okay. So if supervision is stringent and effective, okay, it should have worked. And so we should go back to the past where district directors will, on account of vacancies in schools in their districts, they will be giving quotas. Once they get the teachers, they determine based on that data from the school level where to post teachers. And let's end the practice of allowing teachers who have been posted to certain schools to have the luxury of altering their, their posting at the national level or at the regional level. It should end. Other than that, we'll continue to populate urban schools and peri-urban schools with more teachers than they need. Right. And deprive rural schools with the future chest that they also need. Thank perfect. you. Perfect point. Thank you. Um, what's the, yes, please. Um, 
Good morning. My name is Angela Ado. I am a level 200 student from the University of Professional Studies. Um, please, I just wanted to ask if there has been any provision to revise the new curriculum that is being um, practiced in the basic educational system, especially with the inclusion of new subjects such as the OAP, that is our world, our people. And, you know, talking about a society which is slowly digressing from the theoretical form of education and moving towards the more applied, hands-on, and practical form of education. Thank you. Good stuff. Thank you. Um, the new curriculum. There was a hand. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. I'm Joseph Souk, a student of UPSA. Souk. Yes. Joseph Souk. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, I heard them talk about uh, the criteria for teachers now that it has been moved from uh, just a an ordinary diploma holder to degree holders. Then I want to find out um, with that, what are some of the competencies that makes the degree holders that we think uh, graduates, right, teachers, different from those who were with the diploma qualification? What makes them so different? What competencies are we equipping them with that makes the imparters which are those teachers graduating, that they can impart it to the impartees, which are the students in the basic level. That makes it different. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, please. OK, my name is Nicolas Sapon, a student of University of Professional Studies, Accra. My question has to do with people with disabilities, especially the students with disabilities. So with my research I conducted, I saw there are 26 um, special school for the Okay, so with people with disabilities. So my question here is, what are we doing as a ministry to facilitate their learning? You can see that with the introduction of the bill. So with this, if the resources are not adequate, how then should we expect from the ministry? Thank you. Thank you. Um, that is a fact. So that bit on the degree holders, who are teachers now, I mean, I understand the question to mean that I mean, even if they are degree-holding teachers and they don't have the right pedagogical skills to teach, it doesn't make them superior over a diploma-holding teacher who has the right pedagogy. Is that right? Right. You know, that, that, that's a good one. Uh, what, what you're asking is if there's any difference between a diploma-holder and a degree-holder. You know, and I will relate to my own professional practice. Mm -hmm. You know, I started teaching with a what you call uh, an emergency credential, uh, which authorized me to go into the classroom. But then you have to be able to be uh, cognizant of health issues, safety issues. That was very important. But the issue was this. Education itself is a lifelong process. There's no, there, I don't see a cutoff point. That's what I said earlier, that I'm studying now more than I've ever done. What is happening now with the, uh, to, to be, for you to be able to be licensed is that you need to know professional skills. And part of the professional skills is what we have in terms of digital abilities, in terms of ability to communicate, teamwork, and that sort of thing. Now remember this, teamwork is not something that you do in the classroom. Part of it also has to be stuff, stuff that you do outside the classroom that will engage you to see yourself in leadership position. So that's very important. But anyway, the idea is that we want to add value, more value to the teachers at the graduate level. So that is the idea that what is it that we do that will induce you to be a lifelong learner. And also with the uh, digitalization that has been introduced, we want to see teachers prepare their own teacher and learning materials. One of the most important things is that, look, once you come out as a teacher, can you uh, prepare your own schemes of work on a computer? That's very important. In the past, what you do is that you write them in notebooks and you pile them this high, and you don't add value to anything because nobody's going to come back. But back. how about areas where there are no networks, no electricity, as you were saying? Well, so what are the complementary measures that have to be put in place to We have the national problems, okay? Mm -hmm. If you have to drive a bus from one location to the other, we have a problem there. If you have to have an internet access from one place to the other, we have a problem there. But then it's always possible to develop a hybrid system. But we, this is a developing country, and these are the challenges that we are facing for health, for agriculture, for everything else. But what I would like you to understand is that challenges in education are not just unique to Ghana. It's everywhere. I mean, I taught in the US, and we're even looking at what language to teach, to teach students who are Spanish-oriented. 
to teach students who are from Thailand and that sort of thing. And part of it is even the language skills. All I'm saying is this. Education is a challenge everywhere else. But my, my, uh, my advice to teachers is that you have to stay abreast all the time. Don't depend on the government to make sure that you are 100% efficient to, to participate. Right. Somewhere along the line, what is it that you can do to develop your own self as an agency? And I keep saying this. With the internet these days, it's one of the most important things. In our time, the importance was this. The teachers have the information. Okay, so we're teaching teachers to have information. Now that's not relevant anymore because the information is already available. But how do we pass on the information to other, other person to learn? That's when we begin to look at learner-centered education and also even some of our own cultural practices. Let me tell you one of the impediments as far as transmitting information. You know, you look at someone who's grown and we see them as a sage. Part of what the new curriculum is saying is that we need teachers to be guides. We are not having teachers to consistently pass on information, but why do we create an environment where a person's opinion matters? In, in my education through elementary school to secondary school, nobody even asked for my opinion. It wasn't important. So now with the new curriculum, what's your curiosity? What is the thing that you really want to do as a purpose in your own life? And all that, all that is new to the culture, but we have to begin to accept it. What is your natural curiosity? What is the idea that you have that can be manifest in a, pro, in a product? And these are universal uh, concerns everywhere, even when I was teaching the gifted and talented education in the US. So my concern for teachers is this. See yourself as an agent. Mm -hmm. Don't depend unduly on people to make you a professional. It will never work. What, look, people have uh, these phones, and they're able to access all kinds of information. Why can't you access information on how to teach photosynthesis? Are you with me? Mm -hmm. These are the things that we have to do. I'm looking okay. at every teacher as a professional, an agent in their own right, and not to wait on duly for anybody. I've come to a point where I realized that if I were to wait for somebody, I wait forever. Things are difficult assess. We know it. But how do you now make yourself into a professional? So part of your question, again, is how we want to develop teachers to be lifelong learners and to begin to look at other examples of best practices and incorporate them into your own system without someone unduly telling you. These are the concerns that we have. OK, thank you very much. And, and Dr. Pitanti, uh, yes. The, the, yes. Uh, so what's being done is that the conversion resulted in the changing of the admission criteria. Mm -hmm. So the criteria for diploma, those who are entering with diploma, is now different from that for those who are entering with degree. And that means that at least the past three, I mean the quality of people assessing uh, colleges of education would go up comparably to those who go into the uh, universities. Again, there was a complete overhaul of the curriculum at the um, various colleges of education. So the curriculum has been changed. A lot of things have been introduced in there. People are doing specialties and, and specializations and other things. So there is a wide range of differences between those who did the diploma and those who did the, or who are doing the degree. And that is why those who, had, who are having the diploma, the universities are, have put up programs to enable them upgrade on their knowledge, the professional knowledge and everything that they have, to be able to meet up with the standards that are being set by the teaching profession. Of course, you know that now we have, we have the national teaching standards. So those are the standards that are guiding the training of the teachers. And those standards are, are, were not available when we were looking at uh, those who were doing the diploma. So those are the standards that everybody now going to the College of Education is supposed to be trained and, and measured up to. Okay, and uh, there was a question on the new this curriculum, the, the new curriculum. Yeah, the, yes. yes. No, well, we've, we've, we've implemented it. One thing about curriculum implementation is that it continues. And that is why at a point in time, I think uh, somewhere, is it this year or last year, late last year, you, you saw the letter um, taking OAP from the number of subjects that, that, that were uh, supposed to be taken by the uh, basic school. So that is a continuous process. The, 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 the truth of the matter is that curriculum review is supposed to happen within five years mm -hmm. of its implementation. Now, you don't wait till the fifth year before you start the, uh, the another uh, uh, review process. So you do it alongside implementation. And that, that is very important because if you don't do it that way, there are certain things that you will not be able to add, incorporating the curriculum as and when things are changing within the system. So gradually, I think NACA is doing that. They are ensuring that 
the curriculum that are being rolled out meet the demands of the 21st century, and that will be done continuously. And that is why we have introduced the professional learning community. So you go to the schools, and new things that are coming up are now being taught among the teachers. There's a problem with that. I'll talk about that. Chrissy will not agree. But there's a problem with that because now the teachers at the basic school are not doing PLCs again. They say there's nothing to talk about. And that is why we keep talking about monitoring and evaluation. Because if you have people going to the field to always monitor the PLC engagement, monitor the implementation process of the curriculum, you would pick up all this information. We, those who are researchers, we get this all the time. He was talking about Gallup. He doesn't know the state of Gallup now. But if you go to the field, you will know that things are really not as have been portrayed out there. But you, the policy implementer, you need those information, the, the, the difficulties that teachers are going through in organizing their PLCs, the difficulties that teachers are going through in implementing the standard-based curriculum, the common core, and the senior high school one that you're going to. You need those information to help you now fashion out ways and means to ensure that the objectives of the policy are being realized. So when you get this information and you act as if you, 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 you are doing right and somebody is trying to pull your, your sector down, then it means that you don't have the, 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 good, I mean the, the good motive to ensure that the education sector gets the best of, of what we want to uh, present to our children. And mind you, most of the case in the public schools are those who are coming from the vulnerable and the, and the, and the less to, to do people. So at the end of the day, we want to use education to bridge the gap between the haves and the have-nots. But you are in instituting policies, you are not following through, and they are still being left down there. And those of us who have little money, we are taking our walks to private schools, and they are getting the best of education. So we continue to have this system where the haves the have will continue to be up there, and the, those who do not have will continue to be down there. And the way, when you go, read the National Assessment Framework, page 4748. The NLST is there. Yes, the NST, what it's supposed to do is there. If you have changed that document, make the new document public so that we will all know. Thank you. That's well, see, final, final, final quote, um, then we, uh, we, we go. Uh, okay. no, sorry, I'll come uh, to you. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, I mean, like Peter rightly stated, and if you listen to the premise of my, uh, I mean, the introduction that I gave earlier, I said platforms like this offer us feedback. Uh, so that we'll be able to improve what we are doing. But in a conversation where, I mean, there's a general prejudice that every fact you lay out there, because you are coming from government, maybe some way, somehow, is defensive, and you do not accept uh, maybe criticisms, it becomes quite difficult when you are also making your point. But at least for the first time, I'm assuring Peter and Kofi that all concerns that they've raised have been taken, have into, been consideration. taken into consideration. You and will work, work on it. We'll work on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, yes. I mean, I just wanted to touch a bit on the inclusive education policy, which mm -hmm. is quite also very uh, yes. good. Uh, the ministry and, I mean, to a larger extent, the Ghana Education Service has such a policy. Uh, currently, it's undergoing a review, uh, but uh, of course, the policy covers uh, uh, universal design for, for learning, which uh, talks about uh, how teachers are resourced and trained to be able to teach or impart knowledge to uh, I mean, persons living with disabilities also covers uh, safe schools. And of course, safe schools largely borders on creating that safe environment, provide in terms of the infrastructure and architectural designs of the infrastructure. Of course, not necessarily even in terms of the buildings per se, where you have to make provisions for easy access of the buildings. But even in terms of, for instance, this introduction of the uh, smart schools project, mm -hmm. they have also been covered. But certainly, if you go to the school for, let's say, uh, for deaf and blind, you may have to introduce certain softwares that will be able to enhance and assist them to be able to uh, use such devices. All this has been done. So for instance, with the uh, Smart Schools project, for instance, uh, even persons living with disabilities, they have their own customized tablets that they are going to use. If you look at the new 21st century model schools that we are also constructing, across uh, various parts of the regions too. There right. is very disability friendly where all their concerns have also been taken into consideration. Okay. But I mean, in the future, we are working on the, the, the policy to be able to make it more comprehensive and efficient. Thank you. Kofi, and I will give you last word, please. The issue of inclusion, I, I, I also appreciate that there was a backlog of about two years in the feeding grant for special schools. 
Um, I mean, I think in the last quarter of last year, the government cleared that backlog. And so that is heartwarming. But I, I also know that in the 2020 manifesto of the MPP, mm -hmm. there was a promise to construct assessment centers and then furnish existing ones such that you have centers fully equipped and then readily available to detect disabilities at an early stage to determine whether they should, I mean, the children should go to special schools or be integrated within the formal basic system in line with the inclusive education policy. I'm not seeing this essential sense. I don't know whether they have been built, but it, it will, as part of our uh, manifesto tracker, which is a project we are doing, which we will launch in two months' time, we, we, are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are following up, uh, up on them. Uh, to be happy to know, I mean, from the ministry, what has been done about that promise um, in the manifesto. Right. But I want to say that we need to do more in terms of resource, I mean, budgeting and disbursement of funds for inclusive education. Okay. If you look at Dr. General's report, it's, the last performance report on inclusion mm -hmm. suggested that out of 16 million that was allocated for inclusion between 2015 and 2020, only 64% was even disbursed. Wow. And so we have a disbursement problem. And the way we have underfunded inclusion with maximum of 0.2% of the education budget is the reason why you have 16% of disabled children out of school more than 10% for the norm regular population. It, it gives us an idea that we are not funding inclusion properly. So beyond reviewing the policy, I think the core issue for all of us should be how to increase financing of inclusion to at least 1% in the budget as right. was contained in the inclusive education policy, Fantastic. but never you know, um, been realized. Thank that. you very much. Thank you. Let's put our hands together for our panel members. Thank you very much, Zani Safa. Thank you, Dr. Peter Pantiti. Thank you, Kofi Asari Kwesi. Thank you very much for coming. And I um, want to say thank you as well to uh, Amadou Zulian Day. That's you. Thank you, Project Manager School for Life. Nana Jiman, an educationist as well. Thank you for coming. And to every one of you um, who came in, as well, those who, who join us across the social media platforms, appreciate you. And we're going to have another dialogue again in the coming months. So we will call on you to please make some time and join us. My name is Alfred Okanse. The conversation continues. Do have a good afternoon. Let's put our hands together for ourselves. Thank you. Okay.